gardeners, we all get excited about new things to do in our yard, structures we might want to put up. There are all kinds of great opportunities. But before you get out there and start doing something wild and exciting in your yard, you might want to consult with someone with Metro Codes in your area. So I'm here to talk with Bill Penn with Davidson County Metro Codes about some of the things that we can and cannot do and some of the things we really should ask permission before we start. So. Bill, what is the reason that we have these codes and these property standards? Well, the property maintenance code is designed to help individuals maintain that largest uh, investment that they have, and that is their home. So we want to make sure that uh, you comply with the code because the code really deals with issues that will affect uh, the, the maintenance of your structure, the interior, exterior, especially the exterior in a situation like this, and the yard area because if it's not properly maintained, then obviously your property values are going to degrade and it can not only affect you, but it can affect your neighbors. Now there are certain things that maybe we all want to add to our property at different times, especially as gardeners. So we might want to shed, we might want to fence, we might want to uh, put up some other major structures. Can we just go ahead and have that or where do we need to start really asking questions? Well the first thing you need to do is decide what type of structure you want to add and how large it's going to be. A shed, carport or any type of structure larger than 10 by 10 or 100 square feet is going to require a building permit. And so you'll need to come into our office and obtain that permit prior to beginning the building process. In addition to getting that building permit, you need to consider where you're going to set the, this, this new structure because you don't want to set it into the required rear or side setback for your property. And every property has that requirement. So because uh, if, if you set it in there and we find out about it after the fact, then you're going to have to pay to have the structure modified or moved. And certainly Home Depot and Lowe's will be happy to move that shed for you uh, simply because that's going to be a fee to do that. And they're not required to tell you that you can't put that, that, divide, that uh, structure in that area. They'll set it wherever you tell them to set it. So you really want to do that on the front end to make sure you don't have to go back and change something. What about in the front yard? Now, um, what if I want a natural front yard, I want to do some sort of meadow gardening, or I even want to put my vegetable garden in the front yard because that's where the sun is. Can I do that? You can do some of that. There, certainly you can put a regular vegetable garden in the front yard. Now, if you're going to go more natural kind of situation, then you would need to file a plan with the Metro Beautification and they'll review the plan to make sure that the plants you're going to use are consistent with those that are going to be accepted as natural vegetation. And then there's a buffer area that's required, but that's certainly doable. The key on that is to get with Metro Beautification or you can call our office and we can make sure you have the right guidance before you start planting. All right, well moving into the backyard now where I know a lot of us feel like we can sort of get by with anything we want. Um, composting, rain barrels, those types of things. What are some of the uh, things we need to look out for? When do we know we might be a little out of control? The biggest thing about composting, number one, is having it something that you can manage. Uh, a lot of folks, sometimes it gets out of hand, it gets it grows larger than they can manage. It's better to be small than to be large. And I guess the same thing for rain barrels, right? We need to really watch out. I know Health is, Department has been very concerned about making sure we don't have mosquito problems. When you're using a rain barrel, the first thing to make sure is that the barrel has a good form-fitting lid and that it's properly attached to your guttering system so that the water is diverted into the barrel. And you need to make sure you use the water. We've had situations where people collect this water, but they forget that they need to use it periodically. The barrel will overfill. And if it overfills and goes behind the rain barrel, then you're setting up a moisture issue, a situation where the rain barrel is located, which could compromise your foundation, especially if you have a wood frame uh, structure. That's really not going to be a good thing. And you also need to make sure that when that water is draining out of that rain barrel, if you have a spigot on it or if you just want to let it naturally uh, drain into your yard, that is flowing onto your property. It's not flowing onto your neighbor's property and becoming a nuisance for your neighbor. Well, Bill, now one of the big upcoming issues is chickens. And I've been told by people, and it seems to be a very common thought, that as long as I have, oh, between three and five chickens and it's just hens, and provided I name them and their pets, that that's perfectly okay in the city. Uh, you can't have chickens in Metro Davidson County. It's against the uh, zoning ordinance. They're considered domestic farm animals. So uh, don't, don't get attached to them. Don't, uh, and you can't have them unless you have five or more acres of residentially zoned property or you have two or more acres of agriculturally zoned property. Then uh, chickens are allowed. But unless you have, if you don't have that, then you really can't have chickens. Okay, Bill, what about for those who grow some extra tomatoes and decide, you know, I think I'm going to set up a little fruit stand, vegetable stand right outside here, put a card table out front, and go ahead and sell their tomatoes. Can you do that? 
Well, it, it just depends. Really, if you're just going to set up a table and sell a few tomatoes on a one-time uh, kind of event, that's fine. It's like a little yard sale. But if you've got a bunch of tomatoes such that you want to do it every day, then it becomes a business technically. Now, you can have a home occupation permit where you can have a business in your home, but you can't have customers coming to the home. So having people come to get the produce would be a violation of the Metro Code if you do it for more than one, say once or twice, uh, event in a 12 month time period. So Bill behind me there's a wonderful space that you know it looks like prime gardening land mm -hmm. and it's that great area located between the sidewalk and the street. So some people want to plant things there I don't know should you do ground cover is that the place to put your tulips next spring? Well you have to remember number one it's, it's that's not private property that's public property so if someone say decides to park along the side of the road and they get the tire up into that that's allowed, you know, so that's you can't really prevent folks from parking uh, on that property. So, so not the place for my really expensive plant. So I want to protect my own investment and be a good neighbor too. Absolutely, absolutely, and don't put anything there that might be prickly or dangerous to the children or pets that might be walking by, because that certainly wouldn't be a good neighborly thing either. All right, and I know that people might have questions, so it sounds like they need to talk to uh, the permit office, talk to Metro Codes mm -hmm. before you start doing those things. So you don't have expensive mistakes and problems in the neighborhood. Now, Metro Codes is just one thing that might be dictating some of the things you can and cannot do in your area, and they might be a little bit different from city to city, but there also might be a situation you could be in where you have a whole nother overlay of things, and that would be in homeowners associations. Well, I'm out here in Holtwood subdivision to talk with Gina Brawley, one of the homeowners out here, where they have a homeowners association that I understand has some additional requirements and restrictions. So what is that all about? What's the purpose? Well, we have uh, covenants that all the homeowners are supposed to uh, follow. And when they're followed properly, the aesthetics of the neighborhood are kept up and then the resale value is held for the houses um, and it's just pleasing for the residents who live here. Now, this is sort of a dynamic type of situation where the members can get together at any time, really, and, and change or move these guidelines in a different direction. Mm -hmm. We have a regularly set uh, guidelines for, I think we have two meetings a year that are mandatory by our covenants, and then we can meet as necessary to address different uh, requirements for the neighborhood. If everybody, somebody wants to add a structure to their building, to their house, or put up a fence, those type of things, uh, they can submit information to the Homeowners Association and they can review them, come out and talk to them anytime they want. What are some of the up and coming issues that are things that are beginning to get talked about that at some point will need to be addressed? I think that um, more environmental issues are being brought, being brought to the table where residents would like to put in gardens or do more at home small small scale composting or rain barrels and the homeowners association wants to uh, support that but in a way that all the neighbors can still enjoy their property. Well it sounds like the real key here is get involved, know your neighbors, learn how to live with them and everybody can move in all these directions to have an exciting and vibrant neighborhood while protecting everybody's interests as well. Mm -hmm.